Our scripture reading is found in your bulletin. What I'm going to do here is that I'm going to read the John 5 passage. And then when we get to the Mark 16 passage, I'm going to ask you if you will read that together. Very truly, I tell you, whoever hears my word and believes in him who sent me has eternal life. and will not be judged, but has crossed over from death to life. Very truly, I tell you, a time is coming and has now come when the dead will hear the voice of the Son of God and those who hear will live. For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son also to have life in himself. And he has given him authority to judge because he is the Son of Man. Do not be amazed at this, for a time is coming when all who are in their graves will hear his voice and come out. Those who have done what is good will rise to live. Those who have done what is evil will rise to be condemned. Reading together. Jesus May the Lord add his blessing. I also want to say welcome to those that are joining us on Easter. We're glad for that. For many of you that are at home at this time and wanting to be with family and friends, we understand. So, how are you supposed to feel on Easter? In other words, what kind of emotions are you supposed to have when you think of what Easter is about? Let me give you some suggestions. Suppose the auto mechanic that you're dealing with says this to you. You know that part that's for your car? It wasn't as expensive as we thought. <laughs> I'd catch everybody would smile with that one. People, we're smiling, okay. Or I've never seen anyone maintain their car as wonderfully as you have. Again, you are smiling, okay. And by the way, uh, no big problem, it was just a loose wire, no charge. <laughs> See, would that be the emotions that were? Or what about you and your kids at school? You remember when you were younger and kids were there and, and the teacher said to you, everyone misbehaved in class today except your son. And you just said, well, that's normal. <laughs> That's what, oh, okay. Or uh, everybody, uh, your child was the only one who traded his candy bar for carrot sticks. And then you're saying, you're talking to my kid? You know, and so, okay. Or when the teacher says, I wish we had 20 of your little girls in our class. Well, you can have this one. No, 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 okay, no. <laughs> No, just kidding, just kidding. So, uh, so, you know where your emotions are going with this? Okay. Or when the store clerk calls and says, we uh, sold you defective merchandise, we'll drop by and pick it up, and we'll either bring you a new one or we'll bring you, give you a complete refund, whichever you prefer. Are you smiling on the other end of the phone? Mm, okay, okay. That's pretty good. Let me see if I can do one better. In 1991, a lady named Ruth Dillow was home in Chinook, Kansas, when she received the news from the Pentagon that her son, Private First Class Clayton Carpenter, had stepped on a landmine in the Persian Gulf and was dead. Such a moment of reality. Terrible for loved ones. And truly, my heart goes out to anyone who's had that experience. It's interesting that three days later, Ruth got another phone call. And she answered, and on the other end of the phone it said, Mom, I'm alive. Ruth said at first she could not believe it was the voice of her 23-year-old son over which 
She had been mourning for the last three days. Ruth said, I jumped up and down. I was overjoyed. You just don't know how much overjoyed I was. And our response is, yes, Ruth, we do. You see, three days ago, our loved one was in a tomb. But now, he is alive. That's where your joy is. Are you looking forward to the resurrection? Are you looking forward to it? Well, let's look at somebody, a guy named Nick Vojtovic from Australia, and he will tell us a little bit about his life, that he's looking forward to a resurrection. Uh, by the way, just to let you know, he's married. He's a father like me of twins, and uh, he is able to uh, uh, go into countries that if you had a baby or a child like him, they would have basically thrown you away. And he goes in and shows what Christ can do in a change in a person's life. It's really quite interesting. Back when I was a freshman in college, we, we were told to read a book when I was a freshman. It's called Man's Search for Meaning. It's by a man named Viktor Frankl. Frankl was a uh, concentration camp uh, experience uh, refugee in, during World War II. He emerged from that aspect of the concentration camp with the following uh, theme for his life. Until you find meaning in death, you cannot find hope to find meaning in life. This man who would later succeed Sigmund Freud at the University of Vienna said, until you find meaning in death, you cannot have hope to find meaning in life. One lady writes this, my husband died 12 months ago. Every day I have gone out and I have stretched myself across her gra his grave and I have cried as many tears as I could cry and I have screamed at the top of my voice, where is my husband? And I have never received an answer until I heard the message from the passage of scripture that deals with the resurrection. Back in the 1970s, you could not have found any Christian bookstore with a single book on the following, self-esteem, self-image, self-improvement, finding yourself. But if you go to a Christian bookstore today, if you can find one, in the past five years, 80% of all books in evangelical Christian bookstores are concerned with self. Self-esteem, self-image, self-help. And yet, is that what the Bible teaches? The Bible prompts us to concentrate on a person named Jesus Christ who rose from the grave. It says not to concentrate on ourselves, but to concentrate on him. A man named Stanley Jones is one of the greatest missionaries of the last century. He was a great Methodist missionary to the nations of India. He went to the mission field and instantly became confused by the confusion of religions. He got so caught up in the, com in the comparisons of religions that he was uncertain about what he believed, you know, his own faith. And he wondered whether he really was a Christian. He discovered that he wasn't. He came home, returned to the States, and in his own eyes, sort of a failure, he began to read the Bible through, seeking somehow that in the Bible that he could find some aspect of answer to the assurance that he didn't have there on the mission field. He came across a simple phrase from John chapter 1. John chapter 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word became flesh. Instantly he understood. All the comparisons of other religions sort of went out the window because he suddenly knew that the difference between every other religion and what he was reading here in the Bible, because they also said in the beginning was the word, and the word was uh, remained the word. But it's only in the Bible, it's only in Christianity, that the Christian faith tells us that the word became flesh. It was at that point he was certain of his faith. It was at that point that, he, that I had something 
to believe in and something to share with others. And it was at that point that I had certainty about my life because my life is in the flesh. The resurrection, how much do you know about it? Do you fear it or do you look forward to it? What do the scriptures say about it? 1 Corinthians 15 says, For since by man came death, so by a man came the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ shall all be made alive. You ask, you mean the resurrection is for everyone? Yes, it is. Daniel spoke of it in his promises. And Solomon spoke about it in Ecclesiastes chapter 3 when he declared God has set eternity in our hearts. In other words, eternity is in the heart of every person. Is that supposed to frustrate us or confirm us? Is it to, supposed to break us or to make us? Is it some kind of whimsy statement of the Lord? He just threw that out. It's eternity in your heart. Or is it real? You see, we have to know what in terms of who to follow and to follow the Savior. There's a young lady named Kirsten Sturck. She, as a young lady, had planned out her life. She wrote, I love the sport of basketball so much. I was really quite obsessed with it, to the point that I even felt that someday I would be the first woman in the NBA. But then a routine sports physical during her junior year at Christian High School forced a change in the game. Sturck was no stranger to this kind of medical checkup. She had been going to medical checkups all through because she had gone, played basketball when she was in middle school, now in high school. And in this particular visit, however, revealed something about her. There was a heart murmur, which she said didn't worry her either. It's not a super uncommon thing, she said, but my doctor wanted me to go and get one more checkup to see to make sure of that everything was safe. So she, he sent me to a specialist. The specialist discovered that her heart murmur was caused by an extremely rare congenital condition called amalgus left coronary artery from the pulmonary artery, which causes the left coronary artery to arise abnormally from the pulmonary artery. And because of this, the left side of her heart was only receiving deoxygenated blood which could lead then to heart failure if it was left untreated. The doctors told her I had to immediately quit all physical activity until I had open heart surgery and that I wouldn't be able to play basketball anymore. Although this experience was devastating at the time, she now views it as sort of a blessing in disguise. She described it as God taking hold of her heart, literally, and changing the course of her life that she had basically planned out for herself. This is what I'm going to be doing. After that, I realized basketball could no longer be the center of my life. And I knew that I needed to put Christ as the center of my life. Just a few weeks after her college graduation, she married her husband, Dan, who she met while he was a youth minister at the school. And though the young couple longed for children, her heart was not healthy enough to sustain a pregnancy at the time. But God had not quite shut the door on parenthood forever. It would be two years later that the couple were told that her heart was now miraculously healthy enough to support a pregnancy. And they welcomed a daughter. Her, their daughter's name is Maisie. You can guess what the middle name is. It's Grace. Maisie Gray. Very good. But just days after giving birth, she was rushed back to the hospital with heart failure. And in the years since, her life has been a roller coaster of medical procedures in pursuit of a cure. Not just one open heart surgery, but two open heart surgeries. She says, I have been labeled as being stage three advanced heart failure and I'm on the brink of being, whether to be put on the heart transplant list. And just when I thought heart failure was enough of a journey to walk through, God allowed something else. While doing blood work in preparation for yet another heart procedure, her doctors discovered that her white blood cell count was abnormally high. 
A few hours later, they came back in and told me that I had leukemia. She is currently waiting for a bone transplant, a bone marrow transplant, and even as she walks through the valley of the shadow of her disease, she has found a way to brighten the light of those that are traveling down similar paths. As she enjoys writing and writing a blog, and I felt God nudging me to share my story. She says, I am anchored in faith in a risen Savior. She writes, looking back at all my medical procedures, God has been so faithful through every step of the journey, and I know he'll continue to be faithful as a mom and as a wife in the future. Jesus is real, Jesus is caring, and Jesus strengthens me. The resurrection. Here's your interesting question. What if the resurrection didn't happen? Suppose the resurrection is a sham. What if the resurrection is a lie? How would it affect you? In that case, the veil in the temple would not have been split in two. There would have been no immediate access into the very holy of holies there in the temple. The earthquake and the darkness over Jerusalem as the Gospels tell us, would have been unnecessary. The apostles would have all scattered and have probably would have stayed scattered. They would have gone back to their old way of life. They have gone back to their old jobs. Peter would have rejoined his wife and his family. I can ascertain, I think, that... Uh, Assume that there would not be a single day that passed that the name Jesus did not come up in Peter's home. Because it would have been brought up by his wife. And she would have sort of poked Peter and said, that's the guy. That's the guy you followed for three years and left me for. Do you remember that? Remember that? Yeah, yeah, I remember. And Peter's confidence would have been shattered. And today, men stand before an open grave, and they would have stood like that for the last 2,000 years, looking into a grave that, with hopelessness and helplessness and brokenheartedness, saying, this is the end. The Bible says they're all unbelieving, all the abominable, all the warmongers, all the liars will be in the lake of fire. That would mean the thief on the cross is in the lake of fire. Even Jesus, who told a lie, saying he was God, would be a liar. There would be no hope. In other words, does that change you? Would that have changed you? You know, it wasn't until, I think it was 1968, that the Department of Antiquities in the Holy Land found an actual nail embedded in both heels of a man. In other words, what a crucifixion looked like, that it was both heels and the nail went through both of them. And then two other nails were put into, uh, these seven inch nails were put into the, uh, to the wrists uh, uh, of the person. But suppose, it, but suppose it didn't happen. After being crucified for my sin and yours and after paying on the cross, the full penalty of my sin, which is hell, and the penalty for your sin, which is hell, and that those who came to the tomb and found the rock rolled away, they were terrified, even when the angel said, he's not here. He is risen. They were terrified. But what happened to them? It's interesting that those people that were cowards became brave men and women. And Christians down through time have been hunted, rejected, despised, and slain ever since. And every time there has been a persecution, the Christian church has grown. Why? Because anyone who believes that much has to know the resurrection is true. When they saw the resurrected Christ, terrified people were no longer terrified. And they were willing to follow him wherever he would lead them. And to serve, and, and despite the fact that we have a Savior that is out of step with what the world says, so many people have a mind for God, but have no heart for God. You've got to have a heart for God. What does Jesus say? Or what did the Ecclesiastes say? I have placed eternity in your heart. You can't get away from that. You believe 
or you disbelieve. You've got to know that you were built for eternity. In other words, time is terminal. Eternity is not. Jesus' resurrection. Well, we already mentioned some of this already this morning. There are three possibilities of what to do with an empty tomb. What do you do with an empty tomb? Well, one is, is that Jesus' opponent stole the body. In other words, it's empty because the Jews came in or the, the Romans came in and took the body away. All he had to do when the Christians stood up and say he's risen, all he had to do is say, well, what, what about this? Here's the body. So that's if the uh, enemies of Jesus took it. What if the disciples of Jesus took the body? Well, do you think that they then would support a fraud? They came in, took the body, put it someplace else, and then declared Jesus is alive and well? It would have made no sense that they would have said, yes, it's all true, he's risen, if it was insane, if it was not true. In other words, you don't willingly die for something that's a fraud. But there is a third choice. And the third choice is what exactly happened. The resurrection happened exactly as God said. Life has never been the same. Illness has never been the same. Death has never been the same. Why? Because when you find meaning in death, you find meaning in life. Eternal life is an unearned gift. Eternal life that God presents before you is an unearned gift that he wants to give you. But you receive it as a gift, not something that you work for, but it is rather something that is given to you when you accept who you are as a sinner that you need a Savior. It is by his crucifixion, by his resurrection, and by his return that will happen someday that's why under the strangest circumstances, men and women say in times of agony, like you saw both Nick and, as I said, Kristen, hallelujah, he is risen, and I will rise again. Life has never been the same, and it will never be again because of the resurrection of Christ. Let's bow together and pray. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, have you experienced that in your own life? You can pray right now in your own heart. You can say, Lord Jesus, I believe in you. I believe you died on the cross for me. And Lord, I believe you rose from the dead. And right now I open the door of my heart. I invite you to come into my life and forgive my sin. And I receive your gift of eternal life. Make me a part of your family. Lord, our God, the wonderfulness of the Resurrection Sunday is the wonder that we have a Savior who is different from all of the other religious leaders of the world. That he was willing to die on the cross, but more importantly, that he was also able to rise from the dead because his Father raised him up. Lord, we thank you for that. I pray for each person here. May this Easter Sunday be a change in your life, a change in each person's life to follow you. Thank you for it. Thank you for our resurrected Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.